Um, all four of these articles unite reason with faith or some kind of science or social science with some idea of the flourishing life, uh, how we're supposed to live. And all four of these people, uh, Bud Welch, Newland, uh, the three people in the depression one, and uh, er, uh, Sternberg, they all had a collapse, right? Their normal way of life just fell in on them. And then they had to recover. And in that recovery, they became a lot more self-reflective and um, a lot more thoughtful about life mm -hmm. and the meaning and purpose of life and uh, more resilient. They figured out how to prevent these things. So in a lot of ways, all four of them are about unjust suffering, right? So, so I'm gonna, I attached just a few minutes ago, I attached that big outline about the various causes of unjust suffering. I do think that it's um, not healthy and it's simplistic and it undermines the society when somebody is suffering and other people think, well, it's because they're lazy or you know, it's their fault. I don't wanna think about the possibility that, that it isn't their fault because that's so much easier than to try and really weave through how much of that could they control and not? How much of that is caused by the way societies are structured? Um, so on these examples, the people um, involved did not suffer from poverty or racism or sexism. Um, so that none of that, it wasn't because of institutional structures. And that's what we're gonna go into starting next time. That's all, it's personal issues and events. So, so that was another type of unjust suffering, right? Um, when Tim McVeigh, you know, blew off the bomb, that was just one individual person that wasn't systemic problem. When in Minneapolis, just this week, we've had two black guys shot by one by police officer for sure. And I think the other one, but anyway, that has to do with systemic stuff, right? That isn't just one crazy person like Tim McVeigh who hates the government and bombs, you know, a government building. So it, we have to look at the causes. We have to look at, is there some way in the next generation we can make that better? Even if it's a little bit better, at least it's not worse, which if, unless you deal with things, they will get worse because of the way that money sticks to money and revenge sticks to revenge and depression sticks to depression, you know, you have to work on everything. Stress, unless you deal with it, leads to more stress. You can't ignore issues of any sort, especially not when they're institutionalized and they're part of the culture instead of just you know, Tim McVeigh, you can't, you can't structure the society to make sure there aren't any more Tim McVeighs. That's, that's not possible. So anyway, um, the overall thing I would like you to think about is that St. Paul said, when I was a child, I thought like a child. Now that I'm adult, an adult, I've given up my childish ways. And so I, however else you come out about religion or philosophy or anything, I do want you to make a transition from thinking about it through custom habit imitation as a child, and then to think about it as an adult. 
and that's just part of the whole Lion College experience. So I'm, I, my class just fits in with what I think every teacher wants, plus coaches, plus staff, you know, every resident's life staff, the whole culture tries, is aiming to get that transition so that by the time you graduate, you've really made some leaps forward in terms of your own awareness of your agency, your power of choice. You've learned about making choices. You've self-corrected for some things. But, you know, when you get the choice right, you can figure out, well, why was that right, right? You examine every choice, not just the ones that didn't follow through the way expected. <laughs> Unintended consequences, you also have to think about the ones that had intended consequences and how to keep that going. So it's just that whole process. Um, all right, so why don't we start with Melanie and just your, the things that you want to talk about. Um, well, I just thought it was really interesting how you were saying that you can't um, ignore things like when it comes to depression and mental health and all that. And um, in the Aristotle little article that we had or outline, I guess. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to find it. Um, he says, or I guess one of the goals of the story was to activate a higher self or a higher level of self-consciousness or know thyself. Um, and I just thought that that was that kind of tied in to what you were saying, because it's true. You have to, in order to move on, you have to heal yourself in a way. Um, yeah, so, and with me, like being super spiritual, um, that's something we say, like reaching a higher level of consciousness, really knowing yourself from the inside out and knowing how to, I guess, how to heal yourself and how to deal with those things. Okay. Um, can you guys turn on your videos? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I... Uh, should be able to soon. My cat um, spilled something on my camera or on my laptop, and now my camera is not working. <laughs> I'm sorry. And your cat ate your final exam too, Melanie. And hey, they the <laughs> other night they knocked soda off of my dresser, and it went all over my chargers. It just hasn't been a good time. No, I I believe you, but it is kind of funny because. This would be the computer age equivalent of, right? The dog ate my home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I know Melanie well enough. So, yes. All right. Anything else you want to say, Melanie? Um, that's it for the first article. I'll save the rest for later. Okay. Okay, Jack. On the first article, I thought it was interesting how she was talking about depression becoming a way of being and how you move through the world um, because it is really how you perceive the world um, and how it's it's like not being able to remember what love and happiness feel like not that you don't know what they feel like but that you don't know remember that you don't remember what they that feeling is like um, and then she continued saying that it, where you, depression is like finding difficult finding ordinary tasks difficult, like eating and finding like, oh, dreading, dreading things that you have to do. Um, and on the second article, uh, she was talking about how the stress response is what makes us sick and not the stress itself. It's how we internalize it. I thought that was pretty interesting. I definitely feel that when I before a test or something. Okay. So that should, um, that should alert you to the fact that that's an idea. You know, the stress response is driven by an idea, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's, that's the mind body issue that people think philosophy is not important, but insofar as philosophy is about ideas and about how you move through the world in terms of your ideas, hmm. it really controls whether you have the stress response or not. Does that make sense? 
Yes, ma'am. So even if you're functioning at a pre-survival level and your hypothalamus is kind of on uh, steroids, um, you can think your way out of it or at least think your way to a more mild form of it. You know, you, it's never the case that thinking doesn't play a role in it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I feel like I have catastrophic thinking when I have a stressful event and I always think the worst is going to happen. I've been there. And yeah. Um, but do you do that in order to sort of inoculate yourself against? To try to like get myself to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, prevent so that if it does happen, you're not going to, you know, it's like, okay, I knew that could happen. Mm -hmm. Or does it make you even more stressed to just go, oh, that could happen. That could happen. Yeah. It's just kind of like a snowball effect. It just gets worse. <laughs> Ah, so it's all in your imagination, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's why it's good to step back and think about, okay, what's going on here? Um, what's the likelihood of this or that? Mm -hmm. And how can I prepare for something just so? That's actually Greek tragedy is about these stories of events that could happen to anybody and so you learn about it you identify and you see when they overreact how awful it is and so it's kind of like an inoculation like a vaccine <laughs> right so that if you do get in that situation you can go oh my god that's what that tragedy was about don't overreact mm. um so you can think about how your catastrophic thinking, is it making it worse or is it a way of inoculating, right? And then you have to, you know, kind of use some agency, right? right. And decide. Uh, but yes, I've, I've been there. Um, I think it's kind of like PTSD, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think because of COVID, everybody has some kind of mild form of that. Yeah, I actually do. I'm actually diagnosed with PTSD. So you have been or you are? Yeah, I actually have the diagnosis. I've been on um, Lexapro before. and I didn't really like that. But I think it's just a it's just a response that just comes up because of something that happened before. Yeah. Um, so how do you when you didn't like the drug? Did you decide you just can use your mind or what's the? I, um, I don't know why I got off of it. I wasn't really liking, I didn't really feel like myself. Right. I felt like I was in an elevated state all the time. And I didn't like that. So then you could, you can handle what you've got now. Yeah, I quit. I went cold turkey and, <laughs> um, I don't know if that was a good solution, but um, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, okay. Do you think um, that's one reason why you like the assignments for this class? What do you mean? Well, because the class is trying to get you to examine, which you probably <laughs> already have been doing. Does that make yeah, sense? I haven't been examining myself, really. <laughs> oh, so, well, anyway, do you think it, it could help? That's, I mean, this is the old fashioned way. Yeah, this is a good class. It's a lot of reflection. Okay, can you, can you understand how people, this is how they did it when they yeah. didn't have drugs or therapies or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then today, if people think just taking a drug is going to do it, it's not, right? It has to be combined with. Yeah, I think that was part of it. The, it wasn't really helping me. It's kind yeah, of like a okay. Now, do you think, or do you know if a lot of college students have been diagnosed with PTSD just because of um, COVID? Mine is, well, mine is like a specific event, but okay. I, I guess it could be generalized. For I, I don't know if you talk to other students 
you know, yes. peers and the students know, you know, that everyone's going through this. I just don't know. Um, Cause even if I were on campus, they probably wouldn't tell me. Yeah. Um, but do you guys think people have quicker triggers than they used to have because they're more stressed or do you think have students just adjusted? From COVID? Yeah. Um, I think we're all really stressed out because of COVID. What do you think, Melanie? Um, honestly, I think we're all really stressed out because of COVID and just because of life. <laughs> like my generation, the amount of mental health issues we have is insane. And like, you know, I can relate to Jack, like I, um, not with PTSD, but I have anxiety and BPD. Um, and I'm on medicine for that. And, um, I don't know, I like it, I can relate like the medicine, it doesn't like, it doesn't fix what you feel. It just kind of like makes it go away. And so, yeah, you, I mean, you have to sit and heal yourself and that takes time. Yeah, you have to examine yourself and figure out who you are and why you are the way that you are. So, yeah, but I don't know. I mean, I think my generation just has it rough. Um, I think we're all struggling, honestly. So is the BPD genetic or do you think there were trigger events? Um, definitely triggered events. My mom um, is bipolar. Um, and my dad has anxiety. So I get my anxiety from him. Um, BPD came from events. Okay. So I always wonder, what about all these people in poor countries, right? Uh, you know, where they don't know what they're going to eat or something like that. Um, I don't know. I, it's just, that's why I like teaching at Asia University because then those students will have these different stories. Um, but a lot of people just don't talk about it because there's nothing they can do anyway. Um, but it can come out in their relationships, right? So do you think um, all the, the mental health, does it help people uh, come closer, like support each other, the relationships are closer? Or do you think it, it undermines relationships, which would make the situation even worse? What do you think? Um, I think, well, at least for me, and the people that I'm, I like I associate with and am around a lot, value relationships a lot a lot more than like oh that's just a friendship I I feel like people can bond a lot on their struggles and like find a way to relate to each other and a lot of times when people are struggling they just need someone to lean on and be there for them I feel like that just makes people really close okay what about you um Jack um what was the question again do you think um because so many college students are under all this stress, that they have closer friendships. I mean, as a guy, that might be a really different answer, you know? Or do you think, I mean, do you have, think you have closer friendships or do you think you have even quicker triggers that undermine relationships I mean, I, or I see, what? I see people less now because of COVID, but I mean, the friendships really weren't that affected. I guess people really just like don't go out as much anymore, but like you can still see the same people that you want. I don't know. I mean, do, do they support each other more? Do you see? Okay, so there's this buzz that people yell at each other more, that people have a shorter temper because everybody's under stress. So it's this breakdown in the social fabric. Or do you think it's people support each other more? They forgive each other more. What do you think? Um, as far as friends go, I think friends will would be more likely to support each other. But like, 
I do think COVID has brought out more selfishness in people and kind of brought more people on edge. Like if you don't know the, the person, it, the I get what you're saying about the, the quick trigger. I feel like that that people are more are quicker to react now because the times are so stressful. Okay. Um, and they're maybe feeling threatened, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so, okay, here's the next question. Do any of you think any of this is God's will? Do you wanna hear about God's will? Or do you wanna hear about science? Or do you wanna hear about uh, reflective consciousness? Like, is it helpful? to bring in God? And do you know anybody that brings in God? What do you think, Jack? Um, I was really religious when I was younger. So I kind of like draw in from that kind of stuff. Like I don't, I don't really connect with that anymore. Okay. Like when somebody tries to connect with God, to me, it's kind of, I don't know, it kind of feels kind of superficial to me. Okay, <clears throat> it's a way to not have to think about it. Yeah. And not do anything about it. And I don't know. What about you, Melanie? I am going to be, this is going to be really blunt, but I cannot stand the whole this is God's will thing because I don't know. My aunt, my aunt is super like that. Like she'll at Christmas. She'll give us like articles to read oh. and just everything. And yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just don't think that this is, or like certain things that happen in the world. I don't think God would make those happen. I don't think God would let that type of thing happen. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't really, I can't get on the whole God's will boat. Well, not only that, does it, does it lead to the fact that we don't use our reason to figure stuff out? Yeah, I definitely think it's a security blanket for a lot of people. Like, oh, it, it just makes them feel better and more comfortable about the situation. Like, oh, well, this is God's will. He has a plan. He's going to fix it, you know. Well, is it anti-science? Okay, is it anti-vaccine? Yes. Is it in your case, Melanie? Is it anti-vaccine? Was that the question? Yeah. Um, no, actually, in my case, um, oh, wait, yes, yes, it is. Heavily, heavily anti-vaccine. So it's anti-science in general, right? Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, so, okay, then I want to make clear that we are going to start reading about humanists in, in a couple weeks. And some of them just say, get the God stuff out of here. This is awful. Like we can't make any progress because it's a stupid word, <laughs> right? I mean, they do, they say it's medieval or it's 6,000 years old, get it out of here. Um, but some people say, wait a sec, if God created a universe that's ordered and then let us evolve so we could understand it, we absolutely have to use our minds like we're supposed to know about medicine. We're supposed to take care of ourselves. Like God is not a vicious dictator. God wants us to take care of ourselves. And if we don't, we're culpable, right? We're going to hell because we didn't use our minds. But especially if we go and blame God. <laughs> so I don't know, Melanie, do you think you should just get God out of here? Or my God, they're totally, you should have religious guilt if you don't use your mind or if it's just give it to God and don't think about anything else. What do you think, Melanie? Well, I think, um, you know, I don't think there's a problem with being in a religion and worshiping a God, but I don't think we should throw all of our problems on him. Like, I don't think, you know, we should um like things like COVID for instance I don't think we should give that to God and say this is God's will and he brought this you know I think we need to say okay we need to find 
find out a way to fix this because this happened because of us or something that happened. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think we should throw our problems on him, but I, I mean, I think it's okay to, to worship and, you know, give your, give your worries and insecurities to a God, if that makes you feel better. Okay. Um, oh, what was I going to say? I'll probably think of it, but anyway, so Jack, do you say, cut out the God, cut out the science, or you have religious guilt if you don't use your mind? Well, I don't know. I like science more. Okay. <laughs> but um, I definitely, I don't know. I do believe in a creator. Okay. But, and is that consistent with evolution in your mind? Um, yeah, I, evolution, okay. there, there's no denying evolution, it's scientific. Right. So you need to know the Catholics, the Episcopals, the Methodists, the Quakers, the Unitarians all agree with that, right? Yeah. And then our founding that. fathers agreed with that. They were rabid science guys, sorry. <laughs> yeah. And they they changed their idea of God so it would fit their science. That's that's our founders, and so when people say, "Well, our founders were Christian," <laughs> you know what I mean? That's yeah. a rewrite of what they really were. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so that just comes from the philosopher as an FYI in terms of historical accuracy, but. All right, so let's go back to these readings. And let's go to All right, so the first one his he suffered through a very guilt-ridden kind of Judaism and he became an atheist and then he decided, wait a second, we've evolved right so to be spiritual creatures to seek beauty to seek justice truth um and to flourish to find meaning and purpose um and i suppose you could include a creator in there it doesn't matter either way um science is science if you want to say oh god was the mind behind it fine if you don't want to say that fine um but let's see, I, I, did, I do like his view that you should always be patient with people because everybody, yeah, this one, I like this one. Uh, everyone you meet is carrying a great burden. So I really am against people who talk about the mob, right? and demonize like anybody because i think a lot of people are scared but and they're acting out but the trouble is it affects other people and it affects the culture but i do think that you do need to listen um give everybody their chance to speak and then also realize that Everybody, I mean, you you have your own burdens, right? Everybody needs to be understood. And, and this is the polarization problem, right? We don't listen to each other and we stereotype each other. And um, nobody can flourish under those conditions. So I, I that's a major takeaway for me. But anyway, so then you can always, you can write your paper because your paper's coming due. If you want to take any of these and compare it to Jesus or Socrates or Aristotle's virtues, you can. So the one about uh, revenge, I think that, you know, the takeaway as I was scrolling through this is just in general, uh, it's perfectly fine to you know, want to thrive, and it's a moral response. It's just that you can overreact, and 
you need, it matters to have a legal system that works and a criminal justice system that works. Because um, if you don't have that, then people will shoot to kill, you know? Um, and that's what we've got now. We've got a breakdown in trust and we've got a breakdown in goodwill between people at the social level. And we've got a breakdown in our criminal justice system so that some people think they're going to be overcharged and have to get a sentence that's too harsh because the system is broken. Other people are going to get off because the system is broken and then they're motivated to take the law in their own hands, right? And so, so we do need to work on the systemic problems. They're not just personal problems. It's just that they're so systemic that I think you could dedicate your whole life to just, you know, I want to improve the relationship between police officers and civilians in poor neighborhoods. I'm gonna dedicate my life to that. And if we can move the needle a little bit, I will die happy, right? Or something like housing. I'm gonna dedicate my life to try and get opportunities for non-whites and poor people to get better housing. And that's gonna be a lifelong project I'll die happy if it can be better. So, so that's what we're leading into the next section of the class is the relation between the personal and the political. Um, your first paper is gonna focus on the personal virtues of Aristotle. And then your second paper will focus on the political. Um, all right. Then there is the Sermon on the Mount and um, just a heads up, right? Do Americans who call themselves Christian, do they really act like Jesus? <laughs> um, yeah. So I, my prayer, actually, I went to church this morning, and it's a bunch of Methodists. So they would pray, you know, that Jesus, that we're having a month about racial reconciliation and creating the blessed community, which is what Martin Luther King used to talk about. And um the prayer was about that Jesus actually, not only was he not racist, he just, you know, in your face to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So when he told the good Samaritan story, the Samaritan was the one that married a non-Jew and the Jews were racist. And so they were really marginalized. And then the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, like when Jesus went and talked to them or said that that was the Samaritan that helped the guy on the road, that was super offensive. But that's sending the signal, you know, Jesus is not racist. And is that true of Americans who call themselves Christian? Well, you know, it's an open question. Somebody could say, I'm not racist, but, you know, and then you have personal experiences. But to me, underneath those personal experiences is a racist society that ends up pitting people against each other so that you get lower middle class and lower class people are pitted against each other because of the systems. And so they have stories, right, of terrible events, but you have to stand back. How did we get in this situation in the first place? So we so there is this combination of purifying your heart, but then also clarifying your head. <laughs> um, so depression, then depression, is that systemic? Do you think our society sets people up so that if they have a genetic propensity for it, it'll kick in? Or do you think there are types of depression that aren't really genetic, but they're just temporary bouts? If you think about it, the way that advertising or social media posts, you know, create these brands, people create a brand 
Advertising creates a brand. Politicians create a brand. And they make life look easy. And then when real life hits, people get depressed, right? Because it's, it's so frustrating. And then depression is anger turned inward. And then you have this cascading down. So if you had a propensity for it, it would kick in. Um, and then also the ancients didn't have all the genetic information. So they just had to talk themselves out of stuff. So to some extent, right, they could talk themselves out if it wasn't a super genetic orientation. Um, but even if it is, the drugs alone that we have now doesn't solve it, right? You also have to have that inner voice. You have to figure out how to talk to yourself. Um, but the ancients like uh, Augustine, um, so Aristotle didn't detach the psyche from the body. So he would definitely think you can't get over it unless you change your social, you know, whatever social situation or political situation uh, kick, caused it to kick in, you really have to change that too. You can't, there's no gap between mind and body. But Augustine, does split the temporal from the eternal. And he just says that there's a supernatural God and you can think about eternal life. And if you are depressed, you lack faith. That's the cause. Do either of you know anybody who would blame a person for depression because they don't have enough faith? They don't pray enough? No. What about you, Melanie? Would your aunt say that? Mm, um, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> okay. But if, even if your aunt wouldn't, I think there are people who would. Does that make sense, Melanie? Yeah, I definitely. Yeah, I can definitely see that there are people that would. I, I've never personally seen it. But I know people in my life who I could, who I believe probably would do that. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so this guy, the thing that's interesting about these articles, Mr. Solomon, he also had a very harsh Jewish upbringing, but he reacted to it in a positive way. He always thought, okay, no matter how bad my situation is, there's a structure to the world out there. There's a God who makes these demands and they don't go away, right? And so that's interesting to me. One kid grows up with it and it actually triggers all of his depression. Another kid grows up with it and it, it is his anchor when he's in the midst of depression. So, you know, it's hard to know how to raise each kid. Kids need different things. It's hard to know how they're internalizing this. But again, I think dialogue, the Greeks, the ancients thought dialogue was really important and relationships where you have meaningful dialogue so that you can, you can track how, these, how children are actually processing. They're thinking like children. Now, what does that mean in the case of this kid or this kid? Um, all right, so uh, yeah, so we naturally love, right? Love is absolutely natural. And so depression, you know, to cut yourself off from love is really, really, really um, crazy. Um, all right, or unnatural, I mean, it's, but there are, each religion has you go through the valley of the shadow of death. But here's the key, there are false crosses and true crosses, right? And again, your aunt would might make a distinction between unjust suffering that is, you know, God's test and the stuff that's not. The trouble is who gets to decide? <laughs> that's what I have a problem with, the intellectual honesty of it, right? 
it just seems like you're making yourself into God when you're the one making all the decisions about this. So it doesn't seem like it's intellectually honest to me. What do you think, Melanie? Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I agree with you. I don't think it's very intellectually honest. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it just, aren't you making yourself into God? When yeah. <laughs> like, what's the difference? Yeah. Like, get the middle man, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, people don't think that, but on the other hand, like what else is going on? Um, anyway, so then the Buddhism, um, I remember some, a friend of mine in graduate school and her mother was trying to finish her PhD when she was little and she would, she was in the study with the door shut and she'd knock on the door and her mother told her to go away and she ended up with mental problems and I'm like here I am with a little kid trying to get a PhD it's like oh my god this was not uh I didn't want to hear this <laughs> but anyway this is a problem with um her mother had you know some some genetic issues but the juggling the family and the career is a huge problem and you can't just it's not just a matter of you um, toughing it up. It's other people need you, right? And so Aunt Anita needed her mother. She needed her mother's presence of mind. And so family relationships get very uh, complicated because of our dependency on each other. Okay, between science and religion, religion does focus more on relationships and emotions. Um, and then Esther Sternberg was the scientist scientist, right? She didn't want to talk about emotions. Her mother kept saying to her, hey, Esther, what about emotions? And um, finally, when finally she had a breakdown, she was trying to finish an article, her mother was sick, all this stuff. And then her immune system collapsed. And then she started studying the chemistry of stress. And then she, you know, went to Crete. I didn't really bribe uh, Krista Tippett to include the Greeks and all this stuff. <laughs> I just opened the book and thought, oh, this will work with my class. Um, so then she started to understand those ancient people kind of had quite a bit of stuff figured out there. So Anita figures out, oh, those Buddhists weren't so dumb. And uh, Esther thinks, oh, those, those Cretans weren't so dumb. Um, and then we have a Descartes is the one, the modern world, the enlightenment that splits mind and body. Uh, and so she studies the brain research underneath of it, underneath it. And there is a primitive part of the brain, but ancient cultures are focused on trying to educate pleasure and fear, that primitive part of the brain, because they know that, that when that overreacts, society falls apart. But modern split it all and didn't develop you know, an art and a culture that would keep working on it. Um, as you can tell by Esther, she just thought if she toughs it up, if she works harder, if she represses her emotions, but that isn't, it doesn't work. Um, and we also have Puritanism. So Puritanism is a very modern, it's Protestant, and it split mind and body also. And you know that being a Puritan means you're emotionally repressed. And that plays a big role in our culture in a way that it doesn't play the role in Europe. Um, okay, people need to become more self-consciously aware. Um, techniques for healing, meditation, so all that ancient stuff. And so we're gonna talk about that in this class, talk about Confucius and Hindu and Buddha and so these articles are just sort of getting you warmed up for what will come later on. 
And then you can tie this to Aristotle's virtues and vices. And then we move from the personal to the political. So you could think about when, I don't know how many of you listen to politicians talking or spe speeches, or especially when you go to the national conventions, um, what do they appeal to, right? So they, you can have very sophisticated rhetoric, but it's directed toward, exactly toward triggering the hypothalamus, right? And I mean, it's just awful that it's designed to trigger fear or pleasure. And if a politician appeals to pleasure, promises you stuff, and then you don't get what you want, then, you know, they're all rotten. If a politician appeals to fear and um, you demonize, like those other guys are gonna make us less secure, um, then you've unraveled the social fabric. And politicians should not be at the forefront of unraveling the social fabric, right? They're supposed to be the opposite of that. <laughs> Right, Aristotle's political leader, and we're going to talk about this more, is the one who weaves the rich and the poor together, who weaves people together in the social fabric. Uh, Athena, the goddess of justice, wisdom, and war, was also a weaver. She would weave on her loom and give people clothing because there's a, you know, the physical weaving and the social weaving and the, the political weaving are all connected, but um, anyway, so this is where we're headed. Then I had a, okay, uh, how can I, okay. Um, all right, so we do have a paper due coming on Friday at, then that's later than I had originally in the syllabus because of the canceled class and stuff. So that'll be Friday at six o'clock, 1200 words, three short quotes. Um, so let me, uh, okay, I have a few minutes here. Go ahead and speak up if you have any questions, but here's the, go ahead, Jack. Um, will that take the place of the Friday post? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. But you can do, okay, the Friday posts, I think I only have, only 10 of them are due. So if you wanted to do a post, since you're already thinking about it, um, you can get ahead, right? And then toward the end of the semester, when you have a lot of other stuff to do, you won't, you'll have done your 10 posts. So okay. you sort of make your judgment call about when you want to skip a post. Um, you don't have to go because that's kind of you already got the cheat sheet with your paper, you know? So, um, all right, so there's physical suffering. And then for Esther Sternberg, the physical suffering was a result of um, the, actually the social situation that she'd gotten herself in. Um, and then there's people who suffer because of the society they live in, right? Um, some of this is just accidental. It's just the human condition. Some of it is uh, natural disasters. God isn't out to get you. Um, I thought it was funny in San Francisco, there was an earthquake right during the World Series. This was decades ago, but that was right about the time when the players were being free agents and they were making buttloads of money more than they had before. <laughs> I thought, okay, guys, how many of you think God is saying, hey, you value sports too much. I'm going to have an earthquake, get, wake you up. <laughs> or the, th the thing about this is when you start speculating about God's interventions, I mean, it tells you a lot about the people. So like um, Katrina, I, there were 
people who thought, oh yeah, God is judging New Orleans, the big easy, because people, you know, there's too much drinking and sexing and all that crap going on. But other people would say, wait a second, it occurred right next to the oil wells. And God is saying, stop using fossil fuels or I'm going to give you more and more hurricane. <laughs> but, you know, I think on the, on the ancient view, Seneca, Aristotle, this is not God's will. You know, we build our society uh, the way we want to, and we know, some, know the consequences, and God isn't going to change a natural world just so we don't get hurt, um, because then we would be totally unable to use our minds. Psychological suffering, uh, because people are trying to deny their place in the world, or because, um, because of relationships. And so we depend on each other. But a world when we depend on each other and love each other is one that's better, even though that often leads to suffering. The desire to escape suffering just causes more suffering. So then there's the suffering caused by un injustice. And I can talk about that more when we go into the next section of the class. Um, then there's um, Aristotle's um, oh yeah, all of these people suffered unjustly. So in all those stories, there's unjust suffering and how you deal with it and there are reflections on it. So if you wanted to write a paper about that, you can do that. I've got tons of questions in all these handouts, but um, that I also have separate paper topics. So whatever you all you know, like to do, and you can look those over. I'll talk about them more next time because maybe we'll have more students here. And if you wanna page through those and come with some questions because you're curious about this or that, you're also required to meet with me about your paper after you have an outline, but before you finish writing it. Because I'm a great cheat sheet, I can, you know, Turn, you know, show you the page you might want to use. I also can, you know, help you clarify your ideas. I can help you expand your ideas. And all of those things, of course, will give you a, a better grade. Plus, I get to ask you if it makes sense. I don't like to dictate stuff. If a student doesn't have any idea why I'm asking a question, they're not going to learn anything. So I prefer dialogue. Um, all right, so here's Aristotle's long list of virtues. And um, we're gonna use these all semester. I know you're gonna roll your eyes after a while, but, but um, it's news to most people that these virtues underlie all these other traditions. And it just seems to me, if you can get that pattern in your head, I think it'd be very helpful. Um, I just finished reading a book called Democracies Divided. And it's talking about the decline of democracies all over the world. And it has a chapter on Brazil, Colum uh, Colombia, um, Indonesia, Bangladesh, the US, uh, Hungary, Poland, um, Africa, Kenya, and it, it, there's a pattern, right? That politicians, and there's a lot of patterns, but one of them is to weaponize religion and race. Okay, that's, you um, get people to identify with themselves as a certain race and or religion, and you use that as a weapon. And so this class is really, <laughs> trying to say there's no way that you can be faithful to that tradition and use it as a weapon. And I've always thought this, but I, but I didn't know, you know, that the world was gonna revert to authoritarianism. And so now it's more important than ever, I think that you, that you get this and you don't let anybody punch your buttons, right? 
punch a button that says somehow if you're Christian, you can you can you know use it as a tool to think of yourself as superior to someone from a different religion or race or nationality, right? It's not patriotic to marginalize other people. And none of those, um, Jesus, Socrates, none of those people are gonna um, agree to that. So all those virtues then, um, that then we move into politics and we'll do more of that next time. Practical wisdom, you might agree in theory, but day by day, you have to make particular judgments. Um, and, and you need to talk to people about this in order to get straight. Like you might think you have to make a choice between A, B, and C, and somebody will say, wait a second, there's another choice there. I'm kind of like that. When it looks like there's only two choices, I always try to split a hair and find a third choice. But anyway, those are the kinds of things that are important for developing your idea of the good and making better decisions. Um, okay, so natural necessity. So we are altering the biosphere. And so it's, it's we do need to consult with climate scientists who have these, these computer models because their models are predicting a lot. <laughs> and um, we can't do it just on the basis of the past. We have to, the models take that data and see the pattern and how things are changing and then try to move forward. So um, it's worrisome but at least we know that the, the, you can model things that will predict what's going to happen. Now, the, there was a prediction that the atmosphere would get warmer faster. And then there, they found out that the ocean is absorbing a lot of the heat, but there will be a limit to how much heat it can absorb. And eventually all the algae will die which is gonna really cause a whole lot of problems. So, um, uh, you know, they can anticipate things. They can, their models have gotten more precise and these tipping points, though, so once you get to a tipping point, it's really hard to know what's happening, but that doesn't mean we should act like it doesn't matter. Okay, so natural necessity has become a political issue. It's been politicized instead of looking to the science. Um, and then the impossible, like God will come and fix it, is, you know, I mean, that's to me even bad theology. Why would God change a perfect world just because we wrecked it with our greed? <laughs> no, I think we have to pay the price for wrecking it with our greed, which would be a high price, I think. Um, and then the realm of human choice is contingent. You know, there's nothing we necessarily have to do. So we, and that's why we can do so much good or so much evil. And so there are the poets, people try to tell you, you know, this is the most likely to lead to flourishing. There's a whole lot of things that you could, cho could choose, but, Here's the one that has the highest probability of having the longest possible positive consequences. So we, and we do think like this, we just really have to separate all that stuff out in order to deliberate, which is to talk about how to make choices. In order to deliberate well, we have to make all those distinctions. And then, you know, we have to aim for somebody who wants to do what's best, who actively pursues it. And then, you know, they feel good if they feel like, yeah, I think I got it. Um, but then there are morally strong people, morally weak and self-indulgent. Self-indulgent are people who dedicate their lives to making money and that's all they care about or power or popularity. And that does a whole lot of harm. Um, then there's fate. Um, and then there's destiny. 
So um, know thyself, as you said, know what you know and what you don't know. Um, okay, there's a lot of distinctions there and some people are better, but here's, here's the one that usually you think you come to college to just develop your intellectual capacities, right? You take math, you take science, you know that some of the straight A students are morally corrupt. Um, you know that intelligence and moral strength do not necessarily go together, but under a liberal education, they're supposed to. And that's why, you know, the Greeks are a good foundation for liberal education because Aristotle pointed out that they don't have to be connected but if you want to have a flourishing person and a flourishing society, they need to be connected. Um, all right. And then the rule of just because we are a democracy does not mean that we're a just society because people have the power. If they corrupt the power, if they use it to get to over to compete against other people their society will fall apart. And so injustice on the part of either a monarch, a small elite, or the majority in a democracy, when they rule for the sake of themselves, a society is gonna start falling apart. Um, it's inevitable, um, even though in the realm of human choice, I mean, it's highly probable. So that's important to remember. Um, so your assignment for Tuesday is this article, The Virtue of an Educated Citizen, Educated Voter. It's not very long, eight pages. Um, I do want you to come with a lot of reactions because it is, um, I think it's got a lot of good stuff in it that we should pay attention to. So try to come with maybe five comments. And since there's so few students, um, it's nice to hear from you rather than listen to myself talk. <laughs> um, and then here's the rubric. And, and for next time, you can just come, you can look it over and then come if you have questions about it. Um, and here's the speaking rubric. So next week, after you finish your papers on Monday, we'll start the class with you giving formal presentations about your papers. And there's just four criteria. You have a central message, you know your stuff, you're organized and you deliver it well. So um, one thing about Lions students, they have a reputation for being smart, but not necessarily being good public speakers. So we do have to sort of take that seriously. I think the advantage of small classes is that you can have more just dialogue, but a lot of jobs require you to sort of profess to have a monologue, to present yourself in a certain way. So we do need to work about on that. Um, let's see, I think this is, yeah, this is the outline of that article. So for next time, I'll probably start out with this um, article, I mean, this outline, and then I'll connect it back to Aristotle and back to unjust suffering and um, this, the situation in the United States today. So the less funding for education, the fact that education is funded by local communities, so that if you live in a suburb with a lot of rich houses, the real estate tax on your house pays for the public school. So it's just a bunch of rich kids. Whereas if you live in a ghetto and your house isn't worth much and you pay almost no taxes, the public school is crap, right? Uh, and it used to be that states would have the same amount of funding for every student, right? So that every student does get funded by the state um, the same. And that was much more democratic. I mean, what we have now because the Supreme Court allowed it. Some community did it and it was taken to court. They were sued because it's not equal opportunity. But the Supreme Court, the conservative Supreme Court upheld it. 
um, because that's this conservative Supreme Court does uphold a lot of um, uh, freedom that means the rich can kind of run things. I mean, I can give you a lot of examples. So I'm not just saying that. I'm just speaking like Aristotle, like middle class is what I care about. And that's not conservative or liberal or Republican or Democrat. It's just worrisome. <laughs> that's all it is. It's worrisome. If you shrink your middle class, you're going to have instability. And then some strong man's going to come and tell you that he or she can fix it for you. Um, now, do you have any other questions or comments? Do you have a takeaway? What's your, what are you thinking of right now that you might decide is your takeaway? I'm just curious. Jack? Um, I liked what you said when you, um, always be patient with people because everyone carries their own burdens. Yeah, that's why I like my job. I mean, I have the most amazing job mm. because I get paid to do it. <laughs> and I have small classes. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I did want to say to students, there were so few here that I forgot had what I had planned to say. But OK, in terms of my class and your stress levels, right? There, I can think of four different things. Maybe you love my class and you think, oh, goody, goody, I get to do Dr. Beck's assignment. <laughs> and so then you have this little, uh, you know, adrenaline rush or something. <laughs> okay, then the next one would be, well, you know, it's just on the check sheet. You don't have too much of an emotional reaction. It's just something else to check off, which is okay. At least I didn't cause stress, right? Um, maybe you, it stresses you just because it's one more thing to do. It's not because I'm a bad teacher or I have too much work. It's just because your life in general has too much. But the last one is I'm stressed by that class because Dr. Beck is a meanie or she has too much work or she is causing the stress, right? And that's the one thing I can control is that I really do not want to be the cause, either actually being the cause or in your mind being the cause, right? So I hope that if I am, that a student will tell me that or find some way of getting the message to me because, you know, COVID has not caused stress for me. I mean, I hate to say it, because it just isn't. And so that puts me an advantage. Like I have the energy and I really don't want to cause anyone else stress. And I'm in a position where I can be proactive and pr at least prevent that. That much I can do. Um, okay, Melanie, did you have another, did you have a final takeaway from this class that you're thinking? Yeah, um, I just liked um, how we talked about having to separate like mind and body um, to be able to heal and reaching a higher level of self-consciousness. I'm going to talk about that in my final paper. Okay, so Melanie, how does this class compare to the other class you took, the women's issues? <laughs> um, in women's issues, we talked a lot more about just like issues in general in the world and how that had to do with women and women in business. But in this class, I like I like this class a little bit more just because um, we get to talk about our opinions okay. on like just on religion and on um, like philosophy in general. We just kind of get to talk about our opinions a lot more in here and like talk about deeper things. All right, and so um, yeah, after in the evaluation, you can you can just comment on whether the courses complement each other, right? So they can't all be the same. Um, or if if I could teach that other course in a way that's anyway.
the main point I think here is how important it is to get to the to the rock of every religious tradition and it's based on the human condition. So you don't let politicians weaponize it because that is happening all over the world. Um, so I've taught this course for decades and I always thought it was important in general, but now it just seems to be that much more important. Does that make sense to both of you? Yeah. When people are stressed and already their fear mechanism and they don't trust each other, then, you know, if you use religion, that's terrible and it's a terrible abuse, you know? If there is an eternal life, I hope you roast on, on slow boil for doing it. <laughs> but, you know, it really is an abuse and that's what I would like. I think college students are old enough to understand that and to be able to maintain that right in the back of their mind. So, okay. All right. Thank you.